Can we stand this morning as we get ready to open? Just continuing the presence of praise and worship this morning, inviting the presence of the Lord in the place this morning. Let's just open up in prayer right now. So good to have everyone this morning. Father, we love you today, Jesus. God, we thank you, God, just for allowing us to come back and be in your house, God, once again, Lord, to gather and worship your holy name, Jesus. God, we ask you, God, to move right now, Lord. Uh, God, touch every heart, every soul, every individual, God, that's in here today, Lord. God, God, minister to the hurting. God, minister, God, to the lost. God, pour all wine in their wounds. God, we ask you, God, to move right now, Jesus. God, we give you all praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise. Let's worship together.
Jesus. Hallelujah. Just 
worship you. you. Let's sing it one more time. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord Almighty. Seated on the throne. Seated on the throne of glory. Oh, God. Oh, Lord, we worship you, Jesus. Come on, keep worshiping the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah, we worship you, Lord Jesus. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. One of the verse said, creation points to the King. Creation points to the King, and the heavens cannot help but to sing. Amen to you, to our God. Amen. Aren't you glad that he's your God this morning? Amen. Mighty, mighty, mighty. You're sitting on the throne. You're high and lifted up. Amen. And hallelujah. Isaiah said, amen. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Amen. And his train. Amen. It filled the temple. Amen. We're not serving a dead God today. Amen. But our God is alive. Amen. He's alive and well. Oh, magnify the name of the Lord. Worship him this morning. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb of God today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God, just keep our mindset of worship this morning as they put our prayer needs on the screen. Amen. Let's continue. Amen. To remember Sister Sprague's family this morning. Amen. Do remember. Amen, their family, hallelujah. Let's remember Sister Darlene Collins, Sister Vicki McConnell, Brother John Jefferson, Sister Victorine Rose, Brother Ryan Wilson. Also, let's remember Brother Larry Alford, amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer over these needs at this time. Just invite the presence of the Lord. Father, we ask you right now, God, to meet these needs, Lord. God, you said you were wounded for our transgressions. God, you were for the iniquity of God and by your stripes God we're healed Jesus uh, God you said you're not slack concerning your promise God uh, God you said there was no variableness and no shadows of turning in you Lord uh, God we present these needs before you today Lord you said we have not because we ask not Lord uh, God, I ask you right now, Jesus, as we lay the needs before you, Lord, uh, God, that you'll meet everyone. God, touch everyone on this list, God, and even under the sound of my voice, Lord, uh, God, all the unspoken requests, God, needs that's met this morning, Lord, uh, God, we give you all praise, all the honor and glory. God, in your name we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise. Amen, amen, amen. As you return into your seats, amen, our ushers is coming forth to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. We got a few announcements. This past Tuesday, we had a wonderful time of fellowship and good food at our Taco Tuesday event. Come on. Amen. This week, we'll be at Taco Mama's on Old Shell Road beginning at 6 p.m. Come and join us. Taco Mama's. This Tuesday, 6 p.m., amen. Let's remember that. Also, our golden ages are going to Easter drama Risen in Pensacola this Friday, March 29th. Be sure to sign up, amen. We're celebrating Easter at Living Hope next Sunday. Hope Kids will be having Power Hour at 10 a.m. along with our Sunday school classes. And the choir will be singing in our 11 a.m. service. Choir. Amen. Pastor Barbara will be preaching. Amen. Come on. Amen. Powerful word. Powerful man of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Invite someone to come. Amen. We're still taking orders for your chocolate-covered Easter eggs. Amen. You can place your order online or pick up an order form in the lobby. Also, uh, all those that had orders, your orders is ready for pickup today. Also, there'd be some extra uh, for sale in the foyer. Amen. If you want to order more or haven't ordered yet, please see Brother Sean and Sister Bethany. Amen. And get your order. Amen. We want to welcome all of our guests today. Amen. This hand clap is for you. Amen. We appreciate it. Let's stand. Amen. As we go, Pastor Barbara.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. You can remain seated for just a couple moments. Did he say stand up? I didn't hear. My hearing ain't too good today. My hearing ain't working this morning. But thank you for standing and sitting right back down. Y'all are the best of the best. I uh, want to give honor again at the end of this month to a group of people who labor so much. In fact, when we come in on Sunday services, they are always present and they make uh, service possible. And you never know that they're laboring and doing what they're doing until there's some type of mishap. A little feedback and the monitor. Amen. A graphic that doesn't show up just right. Amen. Live stream kicking in and kicking out. You know what I've learned about technology? It's so wonderful until it's not. Anybody know what I mean by that? It's just the best thing in the world until it just ain't, you know, and there ain't no other way to say it. Uh, But want to recognize some departments in leadership. And when I mention these departments, these three wonderful groups of people that not only help us to have service in person, but they also allow us to extend this message and celebration of God's goodness to people that are no longer able to attend in person, maybe because of health situations or maybe they moved away and they just miss home. And so they take the messages that we hear and feel here on Sunday services and just explore them and expand them to so many different areas, really quite literally all around the world. And we're thankful for their ministries. And so if you serve in any capacity, even if you just signed up at the ministry fair two weeks ago and you said, well, I haven't even really got started yet. I'd ask you to go ahead and stand anyway by faith because you're going to be very busy. Our media team led by Brother Russell. Amen. Our sound team. Our sound team, if you're on the sound team led by Brother Spurgeon, would you stand with us? And our live stream team led by Brother Monty Coon, would you stand today? Amen. We're so thankful for these awesome groups of men and women that do so much every Sunday to make our Sunday services enjoyable and possible. We honor you today for your stewardship and your ministry that is oftentimes behind the scenes, but your faithfulness makes all the difference in the world. Amen. Amen. We're ready to welcome our worship team back today. Haven't you felt the presence of the Lord just strengthening us and sweeping in? Let's worship him again today, this Sunday morning. won't come through. Oh, well, I'm here to tell you, God will not fail you. He did it for me. He will do it for you. All of my story, all for his glory. Hallelujah. This is my story, the God of glory. Lifted me out of my grave. Oh, praise his name. I've been changed. I'll never be the same. This is my story.
reach down for me. And when I think of the goodness of Jesus, he pulled me from death and defeat. anybody under my voice that's been saved and redeemed come on is there anybody under my voice today that has been washed by the blood of the lamb come on would you put your hands together and celebrate on this wonderful Sunday the goodness of the Lord and all he has done for you we love you Jesus we love you Jesus hallelujah hallelujah amen 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 it's good to be in the Lord's house on this beautiful day we're so grateful for the presence of the Lord that's met us here already Praying for God's Spirit to touch the preaching of the Word, to not only give us clarity, but give us direction, amen, and give us strength and renewal today. As it has been announced, we are one week away from Easter Sunday, and we are so excited for the guests and visitors that we are anticipating their worship with us. Outside on one of the desks, we have uh, invitation cards that are ready for you. Take a few stacks of these. And man, it's been a while since I shared this story, but Brother Fodiatis, you, I'm sure you can remember this story as well. Brother Mooney shared that one time he got a call from somebody, and they said, uh, could you please ask some of your members to not be passing out so many invitation cards? I, I can't recall if it was for Easter Sunday or not, but one person had the idea that they were going to take the invitation uh, packets and unroll toilet paper, amen, and the commodes and the public facilities, and then roll it back up with invitations wrapped inside, so when somebody, you know, <laughs> invitations to church would start falling out, and uh, they actually had somebody come to church from that, uh, and I don't know if that's good or bad, to be honest with you, and I'm not advocating that you roll these up, by the way, please don't do that, I'm asking you not to, please don't, but... We want to make sure that everybody knows we're going to have a great and powerful service next Sunday. And this Sunday as well, we want people to come and be able to feel what we are so fortunate to feel on a weekly basis. Amen. I want to draw your attention to the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. We're going to read verses 16 through 20. As you're returning to your seats and opening your Bibles, I want to give honor and thanks to every person who came with us yesterday to labor for many, many hours to clean 
beautify and prepare the, the facilities, which is kingdom work. Amen. We want when people come to join us next Sunday for them to feel welcomed and that this is a place that cares and we want it to be clean and to, to look well. And there are so many hands and feet and laborers. There's just too many to be able to announce today. And I thank you for those who were unable to make it with us. I know some said I just physically can't. And I just asked those people that sent me those notes to say, hey, partner with us in prayer. You can do partner with us in prayer. And so I know that yesterday there was many people that were interceding for our church service today as well as next Sunday. And what a worthy and wonderful thing. I thank you all for your many, many hours of sacrifice and giving to advance the kingdom of God. It's hard work. It's, it's laborious work, amen, but it is worth it all. And I thank you. I give you honor today. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 20 says this, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Amen. You know what Jesus did? He just went to church. All right? That's it. That was my whole message. Amen. Let's have altar come. He came to church. Amen. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he had opened the book. He found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then Jesus closed the book and gave it to the minister, and he sat down. And the eyes of them that were in the synagogues were fastened on him. I want to talk to you for a few moments today. A few moments today, if we can put our title slide up. Amen. About a change and transformation to a garment of praise and of worship. Amen. You can be seated today in the presence of the Lord. If Jesus read the word and was seated, I think we can too. Amen. Aren't you, uh, aren't you interested on some things that you have seen through the years? Uh, things that we would say are uh, in fashion. Amen. I, I, I'm, I'm glad to see some fashions come. And I'm glad to see some fashions go. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? Let's just show a couple things that have come and have gone. Oh, my God Almighty. General Conference 1972, baby. Uh, it, it took 10 hours to get that hive filled with that many bees. Uh, uh, all due respect, if you're rocking that today, you just keep doing you. you I mean, you'd be blessed and... You are blessed and highly, highly favored. Uh, we can go to our next slide. Oh, boy. Parachute pants. Now, this is uh, where generations collided. Uh, I begged my mom. Come on, somebody. I begged my mom for a pair of parachute pants all my childhood. You think I got any? I, I, I don't know if I did. I can't really recall any or not. But this was like, I hate to use this reference, but, you know, the uh, MC Hammer. I mean, I just, you come on, somebody. Uh, look at how cool those guys think they look here's the deal when I see trends today and when I would teach at Indiana Bible College these people come in and they got this new trendy thing they do I, I, I'd tell them I said you know what in 10 years you're going to look at these pictures and think well I was the biggest idiot the world's ever you're just going short ties big big knots now it's skinny knots skinny ties I'm like my god you can't cover up your buttons that are about to burst with a little skinny tie like that let's go let's go oh here's one Oh, that's still here. Who's saying that? We're going to pray it out. We're going to pray it out of the world right now is what we're going to do. And the stash too. The mullet. The mullet. Get off that. I can't even look at that another second. What's, do we have another one? Bell bottoms. Bell bottoms. I see people wearing them again. I'm like, have we not learned the first time? I mean, it's a tripping hazard. Uh, walking around, big parachutes on their legs. Hey, Amen. I, I, I think sometimes they're hiding children or pets under there I'm like you know I don't know I don't know but but things that people wear things that people wear the trends they come and the trends they go we change 
as the times change. I mean, you can tell a lot. You can tell a lot about what a person wears. Uh, one of the great uh, business networking sites uh, that connects people together and looks for references and business insights wrote an article that said there's several things that you can glean from what a person wears when they come to an interview or into a business setting or, or uh, to some type of uh, uh, setting where some type of decorum would be expected and anticipated. You can tell what type of person they are just by how well kept they, they present themselves to be. You can tell probably what type of job they're, they're uh, looking for. You can even tell, we know this to be true, you can tell even some things about a person like what type of, of music they listen to. Amen. Somebody who listens to some style of genre of music, amen, is going to wear something traditionally a little bit different than somebody that wears something from like the punk rock genre or something, you know. They tend to present themselves a little differently. I found in study uh, that there is even a marked and noticeable and designated difference and distinction uh, in terms of how people conduct themselves based upon what, what they're wearing. And then, for instance, one uh, article that I read that was published by Harvard said that they had two types of control groups come and they were to complete the same task. Same, nothing different about it, same room, same instructions, everything. But they behaved differently based upon what they wore. They had one group come in just normal, uh, every day, just casual clothing and, and conduct the task. But then there was a group of people that came and they were wearing doctor's garments, those big white coats. And, and even some of them had, uh, I, I don't know the name of it, Sister Robertson, the stethoscope, is that it? Draped around their neck and they performed the function magnitudes better than the other group because of just... The instinctive nature of what happens based upon how they presented themselves. They came in with a higher degree of confidence because they were dressed as doctors. And so they felt like, I can do this task better than the other, than the other uh, perhaps, group could. Now, in Scripture, we see that people would wear things and it would have a tremendous impact upon their behavior. They would give, uh, wear sackcloth and present themselves with ashes on, on their face and adornment during seasons of grief. Joseph had a coat that was designated for him, the coat of many colors, that was intended to show the favor that was placed upon his life. There were priestly garments afforded to people uh, depending upon the type of ministry that they represented in the temple worship settings. They would wear different things based upon what they were supposed to be doing. Now in Isaiah 61, we begin to read some messianic prophecies of the Lord coming to save the church. And we're going to start with verse 1 and then we'll skip down to verse 3. But there are some wonderful promises just right out of the gate of Isaiah chapter 61. And it says this, The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Amen. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives in the opening of the prison to them that are bound. These are the words spoken in the gospel of Luke when Jesus stood up in his hometown and began to preach. He opened up the prophetic text and says, I am he who came to do all of these things. Can I give you some good news today? Why we come to church is that God has given us promise that he's going to give good news to the meek or those who are poor and broken in spirit. He's He's going to bind up sorrow to those who are broken hearted because of grief or loss. He's going to free captives and give deliverance to those who are addicted. I wish I had somebody under my voice that had a little blood pumping through their vein and said, I'm grateful for the God who set captives free. I'm thankful for the Lord that didn't come to the proud or the boastful, but came to the meek and the broken in spirit. Hey Amen. I read an interesting account recently of uh, the mental anguish and distress upon the captains of the Titanic. Amen. When they're lowering those life rafts, knowing that they had gotten away with many of them, and so they were already at a deficit for the amount of lives that they could save. And those who were in authority and in control were given the very difficult task knowing some people already out the gate are not going to survive this catastrophe. And then they were given the task, who survives and who dies? And even some of those people struggling to stay afloat in the water, crying out because they knew that there was vacancy left on the rowboats, beginning to cry out. And some of the captains had to decide, is it safe for us to go into the litany of people that are dying? They would capsize this boat. Or do we think that we could save some? And if we save some, who do we save and who do we not save? What a horrible place to be. What a difficult season to find yourself in.
But scripture is saying this same thing to Jesus. Jesus, I know that some people are going to make it, but the Bible declares that some will not make it into the heavenlies. Who are you going to save and who will yet remain? Who is going to make it up into glory and who will not make their way into eternity with you? And he says, well, I'm going to make it very clear to you who I'm coming for. I'm not coming for the rich and braggadocious. I'm not coming for the self-righteous and those who pipe themselves up with flattery and glamour. I'm coming to the meek. I'm coming to the poor in spirit. I'm coming to the broken hearted I'm coming to the bound I'm coming to the addicted I'm coming to the afflicted I'm coming to the person that everybody else has given up on I'm coming to save the person that nobody will give any time nor credit nor credence to that's who I am coming to save in fact he says it like this on the pen of James chapter 4 verse 6 he said God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble Amen. But then the prophet begins to speak something that is unique. He uses language of attire to describe the attitude of those he is coming to save and gives them this great promise. In verse 3 of Isaiah 61, it says this, I came to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil for joy of mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, let me just break already from my notes and say this. He came to comfort them that mourn in Zion. There's too many people that are mourning and wrestling with deep grief and despair, even up to the point of clinical depression in the body of Christ. Amen. Now, I think that it is physical as much as it is supernatural, but I think that there's a supernatural cure for even things that are biological. Amen. And I'm going to say this, I'm going to preach this, but it ain't going to fall on many ears that are going to clap and just amen me on this. But you can make a bigger giant out of anxiety and depression by constantly saying, I'm bound by trauma. Quit talking about the trauma and start talking about the one who can set the captives free. And I'm not saying that from a seat and position of lacking of empathy. But I could sit there and cry alongside of you and let you live out the remainder of your days and say there's no hope to get out of this. We're just going to cry the rest of our life. Or I could sit here and say I just believe so thoroughly in the power of God's spirit that one touch and contact with the king of glory can change it all around. And I know it's not that simple all of the times, but it also isn't that hard. You can make giants out of situations that God says if you just learn to give me the garment of praise and of worship, I could take your situation and turn it all the way down. Turn it all the way around. Praise the Lamb of God. Slain from the foundation of the world. He says, I'm coming to comfort Zion. I'm going to step into the church pew. Amen. I I just think that the Lord knew that there was going to need to be a healing balm of Gilead that would touch the modern age in which we live, where trauma and affliction and then the pain and penalty of social media constantly creeping into the spirit and mind of people that are parishioners and faithful saints of the Lord and still we feel just as embattled as we did when we were out in the world because the complexity of the time in which we find ourselves in requires a cure, a powerful cure. And I believe that there is a cure and I'm going to speak on it here in a moment. But if you Permit me, I'm just going to pause here to make sure that I'm not being reckless to to share this because I I, I didn't intend to. And in fact, there's maybe three people in the world that knows what I may share today. So just bear with me. I just felt a little prompt there because it went in my notes here talking on that first portion. I wanted to preach about the pretty things of of the crown of of glory, the the oil, the perfume, the fragrance, the aroma of of peace and joy in the place of sorrow and, and despondency and sadness, amen, and the garment of worship instead of the garment of heaviness and, and despair. Amen. But I, I I this would make me feel better, Brother Rody, if you're back there on the live stream, just pause me and then somebody to remind me.
And when I feel, and it's been a long time since I've suffered with those things. It's been a long time since I've suffered from that. But every once in a while I can feel, I can feel that affliction trying to creep back up in me. So I say that to say this. And man, I'm not speaking from a place and a posture of an experience. I've been in those, I've been in those valleys. And man, I've tried to fight my way through those dark moments. I'm not, a, I'm not proud and boastful of saying it, but I've been in those seasons. And, and sometimes it tries to creep back. But I can tell you this as somebody who's been there. You can get out of it. Come on, you can get out of it. You can feel joy again. You can feel a peace that surpasses understanding all over again. You can feel like you felt like when you got the Holy Ghost for the very first time. You can feel something surge up in your spirit. You can feel a witness from heaven. You can feel a weight lifted off. You can feel a glory step in. You can feel a renewal when you felt like you were forgotten. You can feel a faith build up on you when you are filled with fear. You can feel something divine and holy and supernatural and godly. Yes, it is for you. And I'd be a fool if I sat here and said, we'll just cry and ask cloth and we'll just sit here and mourn and talk about our troubles. I'm not going to talk about my troubles anymore because God's just been so good to me that I can't exalt the pain and the penalty of circumstances that I found myself in. Okay, I got to teach. I'm done with that. Let's move forward. Amen. Video, thank you. I thought you were amen to me. I was like, oh man, this is going good. And it's, no, it's the... No, it's the sound. Turn the sound back on. We're, we're through it. Thank you. There's three things that the Lord says. I'm going to give you. I'm going to trade your garment. Take them bell bottoms off. Shave that mullet. Shouldn't have grown it to begin with. It says, I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. This is actually a crown. It's, a, it's an adornment. It's a crown. It's a majestic thing that the Lord gives us. He says he's going to give us oil of joy for mourning to cover the scent of sorrow. He says he's going to give us a garment of praise. For a spirit of heaviness, a total wardrobe change. Jesus is saying, I'm coming for a bride that has been beaten down, discouraged, and broken beyond measure. But when I come to adorn the church with a crown of beauty, the sin of joy, and a garment of worship. This promise is not only indicative of what is afforded to us in the church, but it's also directional. And that we should be adorned with beauty of the spirit. Paul's letter to Timothy admonishes certain outward adornment and luxurious presentation of ourselves. He says, quit trying to brag on yourselves and make yourself look so glorious and wonderful. He said, the adornment you should have should be a reflection of the beauty of your heart. Jesus admonishes the church and encourages them to be encouraged with what they wear and the degree that the decorum is carried out deliberately. He says this in Ephesians 5.27. He says the church should be like this. He said that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. We're to put on as a church, amen, a wedding garment, and it's got to be spotless. It must be without blemish. There should be no wrinkle found on the garment because we, we should give proper care to make sure it is uh, presented properly. I want to be ready for the rapture. I don't want my garment to be riddled with secret sin. I don't want my wedding garment to have the wrinkle of offense found within it. I don't want my garment to have the spot of hatred towards somebody in the church. I want to be ready. And I want to be wearing a garment appropriate for the day of salvation. Amen. And some of us spend a whole lot of time getting our temporary bodies ready for camps and conferences. Amen. If you were uh, 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 fell victim to the beehive cray, I'm so sorry for all the many hours and all the cans of hairspray. Amen. That went into making that possible. But we will spend hours sometimes searching for the proper pastel for Easter Sunday. Making sure that we have the right brooch or tie or shoes and the right pot. We'll spend hours making sure that our mortal body looks magnificent. Amen. But God says, I want to make sure that you spend just as much time being intentional about making sure that you're adorned with the garment of worship and the garment of praise. Somebody under my voice needs to put worship on again today. And I'm not talking about empty, shallow emotion. But I'm talking about what it is to be adorned in worship and a praise. Have you ever noticed that when you go to a wedding, it doesn't even matter if you've ever met the bride, you know who she is? You ever notice that? You walk in, well, there's the bride. I, I, I've just kind of come in and out of weddings before when I worked in Indianapolis. And just sometimes you'd have a Tuesday wedding going on. I just make myself at home. I said, I don't know, bride or groom. Just know there's people there. Let's have a good time. Let's just see what's going on. But even though I've never met the bride, I could tell who she was. You know why? She's wearing the wedding dress. 
Hey, man, she looks beautiful up there. Hey, man, with the veil and the, and, the, and the ornate dress and all of that stuff. And she probably spent months and thousands and thousands of her newly uh, found husband's dollars to make sure she looks beautiful on that day. Hey, man, we can tell. We can tell when we walk in, Sister Aurier, for the very first time. Well, that's the bride. That's the bride. I wonder if the world can tell that we're the bride of Christ. Are we adorned in the character and the glory of his spirit? Does our, does our neighbor see the garment of worship upon our shoulders? Does he see the garment of worship and of praise? Does our coworker know there's something different about them? That is the bride. When we walk into the restaurant, can they tell that we're the bride? When we walk on the sidewalk, just going downtown Mobile, can they tell that we're the bride? Amen. Or do we have blemish or spot? Or are we wearing something altogether different? Have we traded a garment of worship for a garment of heaviness and of sorrow? Amen. Let me just tell you, heaven isn't going to be filled with people that never went through stuff. I mean, heaven's not going to be filled with people that were pampered little parishioners that never went through painful seasons. Now, that's alliteration if I've ever heard it. Amen. That's not what heaven's going to look like. But heaven is going to be filled with people who went through hell but kept their hallelujah. Amen. Heaven's going to be filled with people that learned how to praise their way through seasons of pain. It'll be people that went through valleys and remained victorious. Amen. Can I tell you, I believe that two things can be true at the same time. Two things can be true at the same time. It can be true that dinner was good, but it wasn't our favorite. It can be true that I love my kids, but I'm also angry at them, okay? But then there's some things that can only be true in isolation. I've learned that it is inappropriate and impossible to both love Auburn and Alabama football at the same time. You can't do both. It's one or the other. If you even try to do what I did and do both, amen, you just get more ridicule. It don't work. It don't work. That's not how it operates. Amen. I, I, I've learned that, that only, some things can only happen in isolation. You can't hate to go fishing and be my friend, okay? That just don't work. It don't work like that. And I also don't believe that you can wear a garment of sorrow and a praise simultaneously. Praise doesn't mean that you're not walking through a season of difficulty. It just means your praise is going to bring you through. That's why I love what David says. I'm about to shout all by myself. Psalms 23 and 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of a shadow of death, I'm not going to fear any evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of my days. He he says, I'm going to dwell, Brother T.C., in the house of the Lord forever. He's walking through death's demise. He's walking through a valley of a shadow of death. But he says, I'm still going to have praise in my heart because I'll always wear the garment of worship. Amen. King David is a worshiper in Scripture. He's probably one of the most infamous characters of worship. Amen. Now, when we talk about worship, there's some men that say, you know what, I'm manly. I'm tough, okay? I'm not going to get crazy like some of them do because I'm just a tough old fella. Okay, can I tell you, I guarantee you, you ain't as tough as King David was. When's the last time you killed a lion, Joker? Ain't never even come close. You're afraid if a dog starts yapping at you, you back into the truck. Amen. David went out. When's the last time you killed a big old 10-foot giant? You ain't ever done it. I don't see you on the most wanted list. If you are, turn yourself in. We need the bounty to build a new church. Amen. David's a tough dude. David kill you. You look at him wrong. You step in the, in the, in the way of him and advancing the king. He'll take care of it. He'll go Old Testament on you so quick. Amen. But he's also a worshiper, a songwriter, a poet, a dancer. A magnifier. Now you say, well, David's lived a privileged life. No, he didn't. Amen. Let's just look at some of the things that David went with. And this list isn't exhaustive. He fought beasts of the field to protect his flock. Fought giants. He dealt with hateful brothers. His life was threatened repeatedly, even by his king. There was incestuous relations within his family. There was betrayal and rebellion under his leadership, even by his own children. And the list goes on and on. But whenever David was going through a battle scene like that, David wrote a song of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, such as this one. Psalms chapter 3 says this, Lord, how they are increased that trouble me. Many there be that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there's no help for him and God. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. I need somebody today to get a spirit of David upon them and say, I came in heavy, but I'm going to leave released. I came in burdened, but I'm going to leave this place blessed. I came in afflicted, but I'm going to leave this place delivered because my God is so great and mighty. 
you want to know something about David, this will rock you. This will rock your world right here. I mean, this is going to wake some of y'all up, okay? David was such a worshiper that I read one commentary that said they believe that David invented 2,000 plus musical instruments. 2,000 plus. I'm just trying to learn to play the tambourine on, 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 on rhythm. Can't even do that. He made 2,000 musical instruments. And you know why he did? It's because David, when he was going through something, he'd begin to sing praises to the Lord. And he'd hear something inside of his mind and his spirit. And he'd say, I I feel this sound that I want to give back to God, but I'm not sure how to make it. So I'm going to go ahead and whittle another flute or an oboe or make another drum. And I'm going to figure out how to make that sound that I feel inside. Amen. That's why that song that says, I I got to praise. I got to praise and I got to get it out. I got to pray. And and I tell you, I used to hate that song because I felt like it was just to battle the drum of Pentecostals and get them frothing and bobby pins flying up into the ceiling. I'd be like, come on, let's sing something. I mean, this is just a hype song. But when I read that and I began to think about that song, I'm like, oh, no, it's not. I, I got to praise. I got to praise Sister Victorine and I got to get it out. I got to praise. I, I got to praise. You say, well, are you going through something, Brother Barbara? Absolutely I am, and you ain't got to know about it, but I'm going to come in on this Sunday service and put hell on notice and say you're not going to define my worship and my praise because he's been so good (laughs) to me, to me. Amen. And David, his praise brought judgment and accusation to him. Amen. His, His dance, his shout was just a little too much. Hey man, anybody ever seen somebody just get a little cray cray in their worship and it makes people uncomfortable? Like, ooh, sister so and so felt it today. <laughs> oh, brother, old oh brother, he got it. He cut that rug right in half. Oh my God, what? I, brother Bar, I just don't, I just don't worship like that. Okay, all right, good for you. That's all right. Hey Amen. David, David says, the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 20 and 21, that David returned to bless his household. Amen. He's returning the Ark of the Covenant back into its rightful place. And Michal, the son of, uh, the daughter rather, of Saul came out to meet him. Now here right away there's distinction in heartbeat. There's distinction in direction. Because it doesn't call her David's wife, which she was. The title shifts. It's the daughter of Saul now because her heart has leaned away from her husband and the things of the Lord. And has cleaved to, to the things of carnality. And so he says, she says this to him, oh, how glorious was the king of Israel today. Ooh, you just shouted, so you, I bet you feel good about yourself. You uncovered himself to the, today in the eyes of handmaids of his servants because he was wearing less clothes. He was still covered and modest, but he was wearing less clothes that would designate his, his role and function as kingship. And so she says, you have come and you have exposed yourself and your linen array and different things in the eyes of handmaids as the one of the vain fellows shameless uncovers himself and David says you got it all wrong sis I wasn't doing that for the handmaidens I was doing that unto the unto the Lord I was doing that unto the Lord amen now I'm not advocating for being insane or showy or self-aggrandizing in our worship experiences I'm not suggesting we put on a show I'm not tr- saying that we should out worship one another I've been in settings where I've seen people in altars and one person will lay hands on the other and then the person who just got prayed for lays hands on the person that just prayed Prayed for them. It's like they're trying to out prophesy one another, out pray one another. Like, let's go back and forth. I'm not saying we should out worship one another. Like, oh, Brother Caden came in with a new, a new move today. I'm going to have to work on that and outdo him the next Sunday. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm also saying that I do believe that we should have a worship spirit and experience in here that makes fleshly and carnal people uncomfortable. I want to make Mikhail mad. I want people to know how much I love the Lord. And I don't care who's comfortable or uncomfortable about it because God has saved me, healed me, touched me, blessed me, carried me, covered me, strengthened me. I'm I'm almost done. Good news. I I see the word closing in my notes. Good news. My close is kind of long, but we're there. We're getting there. We're getting there. I read, or I'm sorry, I saw a a sermon uh, Brother Gaddy preached. He's one of my favorite preachers. I really enjoy hearing Brother Gaddy. And it was just a clip. And he was talking about how he went and was preaching a church in his district. And he went and he was preaching for this pastor. And uh, he said that he was in the middle of the service. And he was just absolutely entrenched by the worship of this church. 
uh, he said, man, it was just, he said it wasn't a, a super large church. But what they lacked for in size, they made up for in sincere and genuine worship. And people were shouting and praising. And he got through the service, and he was in the pastor's office following that revival night. And he said to uh, the pastor, he's like, Pastor, you've got an incredible church of worshipers. And the pastor said to him, he said, well, you didn't even see our best worshiper tonight. And Brother Gaddy in the, in the movie, he said he thought that was really, or in the video rather, he said he thought that was really funny because he said, I didn't know that we ranked worshipers like Here's uh, uh, an average worshiper. This one's okay, all right? The, but this one over here, they're a, they're a powerful worshiper. This one over here, they don't even know what they're doing, okay? He said, he, and so he, he was uh, touched, and he, he was uh, uh, found it interesting, and he was preaching back at that church in a couple of days, and the pastor said, but our best worshiper is going to be here on Sunday. He said, well, I can't wait to see this best worshiper, whoever the best worshiper is. Now, just so you know, I don't rank worship here, so don't worry about if, am I the best or not? Am I the top ten? That's not how it works, uh, for me at least. And so he came back, and he says, he's, as soon as service starts, he said, I know who that is. That's the best worshiper. I know it now. It's very clear. That's the best worshiper. And he's shouting and praising and running the aisles and running around the church and just giving God the greatest praise that he can afford to him on that Sunday service. And then he saw on the, on the side of the auditorium over in the corner, like where this door would be, two four-year-old twin boys. And they were shouting and they were dancing. They both had little hankies in their hand, praising God and giving God. The, they didn't really probably even entirely know what they were doing. But they're shouting in the presence of the Lord and magnifying God and praising Him. Amen. And so he was not as captivated, Brother Gaddy, by the, the, the best worshiper of the church. His heart was fastened upon the two four-year-old twins that were worshiping so vividly in that service. And so he goes to the pastor's office after some. Sunday service and they walk in and uh, he says pastor I can tell you I know who the best worshiper is in the church now he says oh well that's funny who do you think it is and he described him he said that's our best worshiper he said well I, I, I'm interested in knowing about those two little boys over there and they had a little back and forth exchange and uh, finally he says oh you mean the two twins the four -year -old? yes that's who I'm looking for brother God he said who, what's their story he said well I can tell you their story he said those are the twin boys of the best worshiper in the church because the boys saw daddy worshiping. And so they said, if daddy's... If daddy's going to get down, I'm going to get down too. I know what dad's going through. I've heard the stress in his voice. I know the affliction that he's going through. But I still see dad come in on Sunday service and worship God to the best of his ability. And if daddy's going to do it, I'm going to do it too. Sit down. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I think I can never really tell, to be honest with you. I think I'm almost done. I'm trying. I'm really trying. You know, we've got a really, a really crazy thing that we say. <laughs> I don't even know sometimes, folks. Uh, just please come back on Easter. Please give me one more shot. <laughs> we say, well, you know, the Spirit's got to hit me. I got I to feel a little something. A little, I got to get the Spirit to hit me. Now worship. You know what I'm talking about? You better watch out. You'll get it on the second row right here. I'm praying it happens. <laughs> I, I got to get a little, I got to get a little, if I could just get a little, a little lightning, but I, I'd work, Brother Bob, I'd run the aisle, I'd, I'd roll around, I'd back, whatever, the, but I got to feel, I got to get in the spirit. I got to get in the spirit. You know what? That's what church people have done to try and contain worship. I got to get in the spirit. Can I tell you, just, this is, just, this is to me, this is just me. I can remember I just got the Holy Ghost, and I was at Indiana Campgrounds. I'm on the, the far side. I'm on the aisle, aisle row, and uh, worship was going on. People running, dancing, shouting in the aisles. And I thought to myself, my goodness, my goodness, uh, that, that seems so enjoyable and powerful. And I want to thank God that way. For, for saving my soul. And it took me a year to get the Holy Ghost. And he finally filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I'm at camp two months later. And so I didn't wait for any Holy Ghost lightning to come down and, and to touch me and to make me do something. Because then it wouldn't be worship. It'd be coerced. It'd be forced. But I made the decision. I'm going to put on the garment of worship here this, this Friday night of camp meeting. And I began to dance and shout without being prompted by anybody. Asked to by a preacher. I just felt a joy in my spirit. And I began to dance. And I felt something that I had never felt before. Equally powerful as when I got the Holy Ghost. Here's what I know about dancing in the 
spirit. Is you can wait for it to happen and it probably never will. Amen. But if you just say, you know what, I'm going to worship God and put on the garment of praise and of glory. And some of you are uncomfortable because you think I'm trying to get you to do that. You worship however you feel inclined to worship. Amen. But you shouldn't hold back and wait for something supernatural to happen to get you to be implored to worship God a certain way. But if we come into the house of the Lord and says, I'm going to give him my best praise. God didn't initiate, and then I answered. I initiated, and then God moved on me. Here's what I'm saying is God offers garments of worship and the place of garments of sorrow, but we have to make the choice to put it on. We have to make the decision to put it on. Worship makes the devil uncomfortable. And what I found is that in, this, in, in life's most difficult seasons, worship is what keeps the devil's advance away. The devil doesn't, does everything he can to try to stop people from praising God. And I believe the devil shrieks when he hears the praises of God's people lifted into the heavenlies. But he delights when he silences the praises of God's people. Amen. We, we focus when we preach, and I have preached so many times on prodigals. We focus on the wayward son, the one who left and came to himself in a pig pen and made his journey back home. But... The story of the prodigal son is really the story of the prodigal sons. There was one that left the home and came back. And then there's one that remained in the home the whole time. Being a prodigal isn't just by proximity of geography. But there's spirits of prodigals all across pews, all across the world. Of people that still live in the father's house. But their heart and mind are far from him. Amen. There was the prodigal that was far from the father's house physically. And then the prodigal who is far from the father's house spiritually. Not every prodigal is on a bar stool. Some of them are on pews on Sundays. It would be impossible to define what a prodigal would look like in a single service, particularly in closing. And I am almost done now, finally. But there are some of us that used to be so active in church. Used to worship. Even run the aisles. Some of us that have gone to camp meeting and been so blessed. But it's years ago. Some of us who used to serve and never miss a prayer meeting. And now we talk about the former years like they are dead, gone, and unable to be retrieved. One person told me one time. One person told me one time. Brother Barber, I used to do all of these things in the church. I used to be on fire for God. I used to, I used to run and shout. I know I look stoic now, but you didn't see me before. But I've seen too much. I've just seen too many things. I've seen too much hypocrisy. Seen too much sinfulness by people that are supposed to be Christian. Amen. I, I, I've seen too much carnality, too much fake Christians that I just, I just don't do those things anymore because I've seen too much. You know what's funny about that? Is that's the same phrase that I use for the way that I worship. I've seen too much. I've just seen too much. I can't sit through a Sunday service and just allow myself to be bought. I've seen too much. Oh, yeah, I've seen hypocrisy and sinfulness on the pew. I've seen all of those things, too. But I'm going to tell you something that I've seen even more. When I've seen blinded eyes open, I can't silence my praise. When I've seen drug addicts delivered, I can't sit through another service and maintain my praise and just try and keep appropriate. When I've seen people come and fill with the Holy Ghost, when I've seen people come... And have their marriages turned around. When I've seen people come and they came in bound by depression and they leave and they leave and they're touched by the glory of God. When I saw a 15 year old that had scars all up and down her arms. Because at 15 years of age she had committed, attempted suicide countless times before. Too many times. And I saw her at a, at a, a, a weekend conference up in Minnesota. Stand with me, I'm almost done. I saw her at a weekend conference in Minnesota. And she, said, she came over to her pastor and youth pastor. And she said, it's gone. It's gone. I said, what are you talking about? She said, ever since I was a child, I have attempted suicide. Ever since I can remember, I've been bound by depression. And she says, I feel something so foreign that I don't remember the last time that I felt it. They said, what are you feeling? She says, joy. 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 And joy swept in that room. And the power of the Holy Ghost swept in that place. Amen. When somebody says, I can no longer suffer the stain of the garment of sorrow. When God has provided me an opportunity to pick up the garment of praise. I was with my great uncle a couple of 
weeks ago when we went back to Indianapolis for a few days. I wanted to see my uncle. I went to visit my pastor, had a couple other personal things to accomplish. And I sat with my uncle, just turned 100 years of age, 100 years old. And I'm going to tell you something. He's going to outlive all of us. Just, I was like, Uncle Norm, how do you look younger than when I left four years ago? How is this possible? He says, I don't know, just the Lord. I'm like, that's probably it. And we sat there. And he said, Chris, I can remember. He loves to tell stories that we should write a novel about his life. You wouldn't even believe it. He said, I can remember growing up on a, in the farm. He said, he told me a couple details about his dad and kind of a rough fella. He said, we went to a little revival, just a little, little revival, had dust shavings on the ground. I don't believe it was even under a tent. I believe it was still indoor, but had dust shavings on the ground because of dirt floors or whatever. He said, my dad came home from one of his weekend excursions and partying and drunk and everything. And he came and mom invited him to go to church and, and he agreed and he went. He said, and the Holy Ghost fell and worship broke out in that place. He said, my dad, this tough, kind of angry, stoic man, he said he fell in the, in the wood chips and the wood piles and began to roll and oh, holy roller, literally, he's rolling around. And we came to, he was so embarrassed that he had to depart from that service because he just didn't know that he was going to worship that way. And he didn't receive the gift of the Holy Ghost there. I would have thought that he would have got the Holy Ghost in that moment. But God did not fill him with the Holy Ghost in that moment. But he went back home and he kind of hid himself in the home. And the evangelist, as my uncle said, the evangelist came and stayed with the family that night at my grandma and grandpa Cunningham's house. And he stayed there. And he sat about 1, 2 in the morning. The evangelist got up from the bedroom and he went and he sat on an old rocking chair outside on the front porch, the front stoop. And he just sat there and he began to pray. Because my great-grandpa Cunningham was out someplace, just uh, didn't really know where he was at. He left. They could hear his footsteps, and he left, and he went outside, I think, to the apple orchard or someplace. And he came back. He came back from a moment of prayer with the Lord. And he came back speaking in tongues. And the evangelist sat there, and he just prayed with him for half an hour, an hour. I can't recall exactly how my Uncle Norm put it, and prayed with him. And God filled that man with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then my uncle, amen, my uncle said he felt like the Lord said to him, Now, what are you going to do, Norm? He says, well, I don't think I'm ready for all of this. So he packed up his bags as a young teenager, and he moved up to Minnesota for the next 20 years. And then God still found him up in northern parts of the United States and filled him with the Holy Ghost in a tiny little apostolic, red-hot, several-week-long revival. And he moved back home to Indianapolis. But he's talking. And I want to share this with you. I know I could have ended probably 20 minutes ago, and we would have been excited. But I want to, I, this, this is where it's at. This is where it's at. He talks, and I'm just sitting there, Brother Angel, I'm just listening to this, this elder speak. And he starts talking about things that happened in life. I went through this. I lost my business here. I was betrayed by somebody that I went into business with here and friends and family members. He had three children. He lived to be 100. Sometimes things happen, but all three of his kids died before he did. And he's going through and he's spending time recalling every account and how it went. And, it, and oh, you know, John, he came and he showed up on, on Christmas Day and wasn't feeling good. And it's the last time I saw him. And he's talking about all of these things, these heavy, difficult things. But you know what he was doing the whole time? You know what he's doing the whole time? As tears are running down his face, he's got both hands in the air. And his head tilted back in a really unlikely spot on a chair. Shows the door in the skin. And he's talking, I lost my first son. I lost Vicky. I lost my dog. But God's been so good. And he starts speaking in tongues of the Holy Ghost. And this little back patio, this little sunroom, filled that place. And I don't know that I felt it more strongly before or since that moment for the longest time. But he goes through and he says, Chris, I got to tell you this story. And this difficult thing happened to my. But God has been so good. God has been so good. God has been so good. I'm preaching to somebody that might feel like you're on the pathway to prodigal but staying in the father's house when's the last time that you just put aside this bank and say God you've been good to me when's the last time that you quit coming to church and said I'm not going to focus on the things that have been done wrong I'm not going to focus on the things that have hurt me I'm not going to focus on the things that I wish was done differently, but I'm going to come into the house of the Lord and I'm going to praise God because he's been so good. This would be a good time for somebody to go ahead and say, you know what, I want that. 
I want the garment of worship in my life. I need the garment of praise to touch my soul. I need the garment of praise to touch my heart today. I need the garment of joy to touch my life today. I need the garment of power and peace to touch my life today. Because I've been so bound by the garment of heaviness that I'm really to trade it for the garment of joy. Come on, these altars are open wherever you want to feel inclined to touch the glory of God. Wherever you feel inclined to touch the glory of God today. Amen. The garment of joy, of peace, and of glory is here for you. I'm talking to a wife that's been fighting for your marriage. Come on. Put on the garment of joy. God's got your back. I'm talking to a daddy that's trying to make ends meet and not sure how to do it. Come on. Would you lay aside the garment of sorrow and pick up the garment of praise and of worship today? I'm talking to somebody that's been wrestling with discouragement and despair, disease and sickness for so long. Or maybe somebody that you're standing in the gap for. Amen. I know that you're going through so much crisis and turmoil. Amen. But you can pick up the garment of joy today because it's a promise that is afforded for you. Come on, one more time. Come on, let's come and just experience the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost. the spirit of Mikhail keep you from worshiping the Lord would you praise him to the best of your ability come on would you yield your life to him all over again come on the spirit of glory is in this place